I'm going to talk to you about work we've been doing at the University of Greenwich within the Fire Safety Engineering Group, looking at pedestrian behaviour when they interact with traffic. So for us, we're looking more at emergency situations. So for instance, like when people are evacuating in an emergency and they encounter traffic, they're not all going to wait at a crossing, they're going to cross somewhere along the road. And this is also typical of, say, uh say in rush hour situations so if you look at this image in the middle here we've got people crossing the pedestrian crossing and they are crossing mid-block in between the traffic so even though we're looking we're trying to do stuff for emergency behavior a lot of the data that's available is actually for general circulation in urban environments so as i just said why model pedestrian crossing behavior well in many cases, uh, people will cross the road, especially in the UK, if it's easy to do so and it's convenient for them to do so at their current location, they will not make the effort or time to travel to a, uh, a designated crossing area. In emergency situations, what we're interested in, and it's quite common during peak times. Uh, during this research, we've identified two key psychological behaviours we're interested in, and that's urgency and risk taker. So that influence when or where a person will cross risk urgency and risk taker how they will cross now we propose that whether they're going to take a riskier take of crossing so when we talk about risk taker crossing so non-risk taker or risk averse is like they will look for both lanes in the road is clear and then attempt to cross when it's safe to do so but a risk taker approach would be like cross the first lane wait in the middle and then cross the second lane so so that type of behavior we want to capture that and general research has actually shown rather than urgency being a factor, it tends to come down to age and gender. So young males are more likely to take a riskier approach to crossing the road than say older individuals. Now, we looked at using SUMO and SUMO has its pedestrian model. So we looked at using SUMO's pedestrian model. Um, however, it is lane based, so it doesn't represent individual people at any arbitrary locations very well, it represents a long lane, and it doesn't support crossing outside of designated areas. So it allows crossing at, at, you know, at designated crossing locations, but at the moment it doesn't allow that, and it's difficult to put that behavior in using the current pedestrian model. So therefore, we identified there's a need to couple SUMO to a third party pedestrian model. So, before I go into how we link the two, I'll give you a bit of background information to Exodus. So Exodus is a pedestrian model and it started development back in the early 90s. It's been going for a long time, but there's a unique feature in Exodus that it can mix macroscopic models like course models using flow rates and space with microscopic models where you can have a predictive method. The difference is the microscopic mo model is very process intensive, lots uses lots of CPU, so difficult to use at urban scale. And uh, the macroscopic method, you lose a lot of the behavioral interactions between the pedestrians. So therefore we have an in-between model on the top left, which is a street spatial model that use discretizes space. That captures some of the behaviors of pedestrian interaction or person interaction. And that's important for our urban scale model. And I'll explain that later how we use both all three techniques in our urban scale model. And here in the bottom right is how it mixes the three. So that's, that's a unique feature. And this is what helps us allow to model uh, urban scale pedestrian modeling. So this is the sort of thing we're aiming to do. Now we're looking at emergency evacuations at urban scale. And here we have a simulation and we have the fire. This is the, um, the wildfire advancing on a, a rural setting inside Australia. We have the vehicle evacuation, the pedestrian model evacuation. In the past, we normally do these in uncoupled ways. So we do the fire simulation, we then do the vehicle simulation, and we do the pedestrian simulation. However, a lot of research recently within this area, area has been looking at how can we look at the interaction because the fire impacts the routes that are available, where people may cross roads, may impact the evacuation of the pedestrian or, or the traffic. And also in a rural setting like this, there isn't many designated pedestrian crossings anyway, they have to cross at arbitrary locations. 
So I have written this as a research paper and the details of how we link X to the sumo are in there. So I only give a very basic description here. So basically we've got Exodus on the right with all its internal behaviors and it can work out toxicity and agent impact and the spread of the hazard. And it links to Sumo by the trace interface. Now Exodus needs to have store of vehicle and vehicle movement information so it can identify how and when a pedestrian may cross a road. So how do we synchronize the two models? Both Exodus and Sumo read OpenStreetMap data. Uh, however, to make sure they're synchronized, Exodus will also read the sumo.net file. So it will read that in, this is in Exodus, it reads those in. And for the payment area, it uses the find node method, uh, just because of computational efficiency, but it captures the individual movements and positions on the pavements that we need to know. However, over the road, when a pedestrian crosses the road, we use a continuous approach because the find node model method's got limitations in the sense that it can't consider collisions within, it only considers collisions within a, the vicinity of the adjacent nodes, where if you use a lane-based collision avoidance, you've got pedestrians crossing here, you need to look across the lane and therefore you use a continuous movement model there. So that's how we synchronize the two models. So Exodus knows all about the sumo geometry and its connections, um, and it knows where the vehicles are. Now, when we have a pedestrian here, he's moving, moving along the sidewalks or the pavements, they want to cross the road, they will attempt to use cross this road using the gap acceptance behaviours I mentioned earlier. So there's a risk averse method where they use look at double gates, double gaps, so they look at both directions to see if the road's safe to do so and clear. Or if they're considered a risk taker, they may look to see if the first lane is clear cross that and wait in the middle and then continue. Now, this pedestrian here has got target destination D here and they have a patient attribute. So if they can't cross the road with a given patient uh, in the time specified by their patients, they will then move to the next cell size, which is 10 meters. So they'll move along another 10 meters on the pavement. Uh, the 10 meters comes from research from other researchers who found this is a convenient distance to use where people will reconsider where to cross. They also found that if a pedestrian was within 10 metres of a crossing, they would tend to use the crossing. If they're outside that, they may consider crossing elsewhere. So it kind of come up in a number of papers, this 10 metres, but it's an arbitrary value. It's arbitrary and probably might be refined later. So they continue attempting and they move across. And they'll keep doing that until they either go beyond the target another 50 metres or and then they might head back. In this case, these things are arbitrary at the moment because all this is subject to calibration until they eventually cross the road. So I won't dwell too much on this slide because this just gives you how, or just tells you that we use a probabilistic method for crossing behavior. So we use a cumulative logistic function. So looking at the gap the pedestrian will do, they've got a probability of accepting that gap. And then if they accept it, they will then attempt to cross. Uh, on the next slide, I'll talk about these key parameters, the time gap parameter and the critical time factor, which is shown on the next slide. Now, we use data from a number of researchers here. So there's lots of researchers here, and that's all, all that data is collected in a general urban environment, not under emergency conditions. So further work for us is to try and see how this research relates to emergency conditions when people are in more of an urgency to cross the road or get away from a threat. So here we have our representation of the crossing. So at the moment, the research is based on crossing two lanes or you're crossing one lane. And now when an agent positioned here at the lower part of the road and heads across the road, so they're going they're crossing upwards, they consider the position of vehicle C on the first lane, so the first vehicle on the, the, the first lane, and then the second two vehicles passing and they consider those two vehicles because they may be able to cross between C and B. However, B may pass, they may cross between C and A. Uh, and you can use the same sort of algorithm for uh, one-way roads as well as two-way roads. And if you look at my equation before, 
The only difference between the double gap and the rolling gap is the parameters they use in that equation. So in the rolling gap, they're only using the, um, the time to cross the first lane as the critical time factor and the approaching vehicle TVA and the probability function. So, so, so what happens when a pedestrian crosses? So here we have an image of them crossing the road. Uh, the pedestrians, what we do use, we use part of the SUMO's implementation of pedestrians, but we only communicate critical pedestrians to SUMO that may impact the traffic movement. So here, the nearest pedestrian to this vehicle here, uh, on the top left is this pedestrian, and that's communicated to SUMO, and that would be a stationary possession, possession, pedestrian we position on the road. And that, that will remain there until that person has cleared that lane, and then it will get the next nearest one. And similar for the other side. So the nearest pedestrian to this person on the right, this vehicle on the right is here, and that's communicated to, to Susumo here. And you can see this here, this vehicle was braking because it has to slow down because it's, it's seen a pedestrian on the road. Here, it's still continuing its normal speed. So, in my last three minutes of my presentation, I have got to talk about the demonstration case. So here we're going to have a look of the, what's the impact on the assembly time for people exiting from a station. Now, this we could say it's emergency evacuation, but it's a non-urgent evacuation. It's more like a load of people arriving at a station and heading to some location outside. So here we have a population within the station. Uh, the population. It's just an arbitrary population. We're populated as three people per meter squared. And that's just a rough way of populating a, a um, station of this size. Uh, we have a road and we have an assembly location. And here we're just showing what the simulation would look like uh, if there was no road there. So here's my demonstration, demonstration scenarios. So for that station, I've got four different scenarios. I've got the case where we've got no pedestrian interaction, and this is how we would, used to run simulations in the past, where the vehicles and the pedestrians take no notice of each other and they just simply pass through each other. And that's like a base case scenario. Uh, a case where we've got 100% risk averse, so you all use the double gap method. And then we've got 100% risk taker, where they, they, they use the rolling gap method of crossing. And then, and if you see that, they get more people on the pavement because more on the road because there's more people willing to cross. And here we've got a mixture of 50 50. So we're just comparing the impacts on the assembly time of the pedestrians outside. So here we have it, the simulation running. And here we have the evacuating people. And below we have Sumo here. And if you look carefully, every now and again, when they start to cross, you'll see pedestrians flicking up or appearing suddenly in the sumo window there you get pedestrian 14 just appeared there so they're waiting the road this is all risk averse so they're not going to impact the flow of the traffic much at all because they're looking for an acceptable gap and if they accept it with a certain probability they then attempt to cross so these are the simulation results and as you kind of expect when there's no interaction the time to assemble is the quickest uh, when they're all risk averse, it's the longest. And then if they're all risk takers, you then get the next quickest. Now, if you look at the bottom right, scenario three, we get a lot of people on the, on the road and there's a limitation in our algorithm. What we're missing is the algorithm considers vehicles, but the pedestrians don't consider other people already crossing the road. So when if you've got a lot of risk takers and they all start to cross at the same time, they may not be able to get off the road onto the opposite sidewalk because of congestion. So therefore congestion starts to build up on the road and it starts to block the vehicles. Now, also to show the variability that we've got the number of simulations and that's the number of simulations we have to run to achieve a 95% confidence interval on the mean assembly time. So how much that's influenced by how much variability in the simulation results. So 
to demonstrate more about the variability, here we have the assembly time. So this is assembly graph, and this is the time for the first person to arrive and the time for the last uh, pedestrian to arrive. And you can see when there's no interaction, there's very little variability because there, there's very little randomness in the simulation. Uh, and then when you look at all the risks, that, where they're all 50% risk for us, you get a wider range of results. And this shaded area is showing the minimum and maximum assembly time rate graph. So you can see there's a much more, there's a, there's a larger spread of numbers. So we're adding more variability and adding extra predictive power into the model. So this brings me on to my last slide. So as a summary, our key research here was, can we use SUMO to, fight, to represent pedestrians crossing arbitrary locations or a mid block? And the great thing is the Tracy API provided all the function we needed to do this. And this research is good for us and it's interest for emergency services at urban planners. Uh, emergency, as, as I mentioned earlier, is quite a lot of research into trying to get fully coupled pedestrian vehicle and all other forms of emergency evacuations. And even looking at putting in uh, evacuation by sea, which, was, which occurred in Greece recently in the wildfires there. Uh, we can kind of measure or start to measure the impact of vehicle pedestrian interaction on travel times. And well, we've got this new behavior called urgency and to set whether people wouldn't take risks or not when crossing. And that will be developed further as we understand better how um, people interact in emergency situations. And we get more information from that, hopefully from uh, if we get more video data of actual emergency situations concerning pedestrian vehicle interactions. We've got the different crossing behaviors. And the key benefit is for this multimodal transport evacuation scenario simulation capability. However, there's a lots of limitations to this work. It's mainly just experimental because we still got more data collection to do with verification validation. But what we've proved is we can kind of model this behavior. Uh, and when people um, cross roads, we need to consider more than just the vehicles. We also the, when they have the decision making, they also need to consider the behavior of other pedestrians on the road. Is there anybody else on the road? Will they block me from getting the other side? And that's a kind of another area for research we need to look at. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. And uh, thanks for listening. And I think I finished on time.